Aside from the copy and limit transform constraints, the transform constraints also include limit distance, maintain volume, and transformation constraints. Keep in mind that all constraints and concepts in this video also apply to bone constraints. The transformation constraint is the biggest one we should talk about. This is a very powerful constraint that helps map certain transformations to affect other kinds of transformations. For example, in the copy location constraint, we can have the location of one object affect the location of another object pretty easily. Same with copy rotation and copy scale. However, if we wanted to use the location of one object to affect the rotation of another object, we wouldn't be able to do it with those constraints. These are two different transformation channels. However, with the transformation constraint, we can do just that. Let's go ahead and add this constraint to our monkey object. Now, these settings look a bit intimidating, but it's pretty simple to tinker around with once you understand what it does. The source section of the constraint settings refers to the target object settings. Here you can choose what type of transformation you want to listen to from the target object. This includes lock, rot, and scale. And the destination section of the constraint settings refers to the constrained object. Here you can choose what type of transformation to affect for the constrained object. The source to destination mapping section lets you choose which axis of the target object affects which axis of the constrained object. And the x, y, and z values you see in both sections is for setting a ratio of movement between each object. This is where the magic happens. So let's say very simply that we want every 10 meters of the target object's location to drive 90 degrees of the constrained object's rotation. We can do this by changing the transformation type in our constraint settings. Our source, or target object, is already set to location, so we'll make sure to set our destination object to rotation. Then we can simply change the max value of the x-axis to 10 meters for the source. And to make sure that these 10 meters will rotate the x-axis of the constrained object 90 degrees, we can change the max value of the x-axis to 90 degrees for the destination. And now, as we move our target object along the x-axis, you can see that the constrained object is rotating a maximum of 90 degrees. Now, let's say we wanted to drag our cube further while still affecting our monkey object. Well, to do that, maybe we can say every 20 meters will rotate the constrained object 180 degrees, giving us a bit more leeway. However, that's not really practical, as we'd have to go on forever multiplying redundantly until we're confident the range is what we need. No. Instead, we can simply keep our 10 meters to 90 degrees ratio and go to the top of our constraint to check the extrapolate option. This will extend our ratio infinitely and allow us to go past the limits of the min and max, but maintain the same ratio of transformation. Now, if we wanted to have the y location of the source object affect the x-axis rotation of the constrained object, we would just need to change the source to destination mapping here. Instead of x to x, we can change this first value to y. And yes, you can have the same source transformation axis drive two destination transformation axes if you like. And then we would simply need to change the maximum y value to complete the ratio. This should give you a fundamental understanding of the transformation constraint. The limit distance constraint is pretty self-explanatory. Similar to the limit location constraint, this constraint takes the input of the user to restrict movement of the constrained object. However, additionally, it also takes in a target object to use as reference. This allows for the user input to set the max distance the constrained object can be from the target object at any time. In other words, you get to put the object on a leash. But you can also invert the effect by changing the clamp region from inside to outside. This makes it so that the constrained object cannot come within a certain distance of the target object, which makes it feel more like a force field instead. And the final clamp region option, on surface, will force the object to keep the distance a constant, not allowing it to get further or closer to the object than the distance set. The maintain volume constraint prevents objects from freely changing their scale. Typically, when scaling an object, the volume of your object gets increased for free. However, with maintain volume, it restricts you from gaining free volume, forcing your object to bend and contract while scaling, just like a real volume would 
if forced to change size. However, the volume input value is a world value. Therefore, you'll need to know the neutral volume of your mesh. I hope this helps you understand more of how the transform constraints work. Feel free to experiment or read more about them in the documentation in the description down below. Character rigs are definitely the most common type of rig. So in this video, we'll be going over how to rig this character mesh. You can download this base mesh in the description down below. So to start things off, if we want to create a humanoid skeleton for this character, we'll have to think about what bones we need to deform him. Mm, let's see, we would need thighs, shins, feet, upper arms, forearms, heads, a head bone, several spine bones, mm, maybe, maybe collarbones? Mm, this seems like a lot to keep track of if we're doing it from scratch. Luckily, Blender provides a basic humanoid skeleton for you already. Let's figure out how to access it. Normally, when you add an armature object from the Add menu, the only choice you have is the single bone that spawns when you click it. However, we can turn on a native add-on that lets us add an armature like usual, but gives us the option to have the armature come as a pre-made base human skeleton. To do this, all we have to do is go to Edit, Preferences, Add-ons. From here, we can go to the search bar and search Rigify. Rigify is one of Blender's auto-rigging systems and can be very powerful, but we'll get into that later. For now, we want to simply turn on Rigify. Feel free to read up on the documentation of any add-on by clicking its respective documentation button here. Let's close out of our preferences window and try again to add an armature object. This time you'll notice that we have an additional menu when selecting armature. Feel free to try all of these out because they're pretty cool. However, for our purposes, since our character is a human, we're going to be using the human meta rig. Our next step is to simply match the joints with how we want the character mesh to bend. In other words, elbows should match with elbows and hands should match with hands, etc. For this, we'll need to go into edit mode. Once in edit mode, we're going to want to first match the size of our character. Right now, it's a bit big, so let's scale it down a bit. But when we do that, it's a bit disappointing to have the rig move up off the ground when it was already at perfect floor level. So we can simply change our pivot from median to 3D cursor. Hotkey users can press the period key and select it from the pie menu. Now, when we scale, we can have the feet stay in place while the rig gets shorter just what we wanted. If this isn't working for you, make sure your 3D cursor is in your world origin. You can change that by hitting Shift S and selecting Cursor to World Origin in the pie menu. Let's just scale it down until our skeleton fits inside of our character. I typically use the collarbones as reference. We also have a bunch of facial bones that we won't really need for our basic character, so let's delete them. But which ones can we delete and which ones do we need? Truthfully, the only bone you'll need here is the head. So let's just select everything here with the box select tool and then deselect the head bone, which is actually labeled spine.006. Then delete all the facial bones at once. From here, our arms are clearly not matching. So I'm going to select the bones and move them where they belong. But you might find this a bit tedious to do for the whole body. Luckily, however, we only need to do it for half the body. To mirror edits you make on the bones on one side of your character onto bones on the other side, simply open the right-hand side menu and go to Tool. Under here, you'll see Options, where you'll be able to enable X-axis Mirror. Now, whenever you move a bone on the left side, the right side will follow. Let's continue matching our rig to our mesh. For this, it might be easier to turn your pivot point back from 3D cursor to median point. The most important thing about matching your rig to your mesh is that the elbows and other similar joints match. For the spine, we'll simply make sure that it follows the general location of where a real spine would be. And for the head, we just need to make sure the pivot point is good and it fills the whole head. The collarbones should also not be too long or too short, so adjust accordingly. 
Now, our character has no fingers except for the thumb. So we can go ahead and get rid of all the fingers except for the thumb, the index finger, and the pinky. Oh, and technically if your character is male, you can delete the breast bones if you like. Or you can leave them in if you plan to use them in some way. Up to you. But if you do, make sure those have proper placement as well. Now that we've done all of that, let's parent our character mesh to our rig. We can do this by going back into object mode, selecting our mesh, then shift selecting our armature. From here, we can right click and go down to parent. Hockey users can still press Ctrl P for the same menu. From this submenu, you'll notice a section labeled Armature Deform, under which we can select with automatic weights. From there, we can select our armature and go into pose mode. This will allow us to test the rig and see if the mesh is following the bones as intended. Now, if you're like me and you forgot to parent the eyes to the armature as well, just select it, shift select the armature, and parent it in the same way. It looks pretty good. If there are any issues with the deformation, make sure to correct the weights by editing the vertex groups of the character mesh. You can learn more about how to do this in the separate vertex groups video. Now, some of you might be wondering why it's called a meta rig. This seems to imply that it's sort of an in-between step for something else. Well, while the Rigify add-on does provide these meta rigs for easy humanoid skeleton rigging, that's not all it does. In fact, its main purpose is to automatically generate all the advanced rigging features an animator might need, including IK, FK, custom bone shapes, and more. So while we can use the meta rig as an actual rig, just like we did earlier, if you wanted to use the meta rig for generating a new advanced rig instead, there's just one extra step we need to do. To go over the steps from the beginning again, simply add the human meta rig, or any Rigify meta rig actually, to your scene. Then adjust the joints in edit mode to match your character, making sure not to delete any vital bones. If you were to, the Rigify generation would not work. You might be asking, how do I know if it's a vital bone? Well, if you're unsure, just reference the basic human meta rig. Any bones in this rig, save for the breast bones, are typically essential for generating a Rigify rig. Now, instead of parenting your mesh to the armature, simply go into the Armature Data tab, denoted by this green stick figure icon, in the Properties Editor. Here, if you scroll down, you should see a large Generate button. Click this and wait until it's done. And there we go! You have just generated an advanced Rigify rig with constraints, custom bone shapes, and other advanced tools all customized to fit your character's shape and size. From here, you can just select your character mesh and shift select your new Rigify armature and parent your mesh to your rig as you did before. This rig is quite powerful. However, if you want to learn how to set up inverse kinematics or bone layers yourself, we will address these in separate videos. I hope this video gives you a good understanding of how character rigging works in Blender. Mm -hmm.